Hello and welcome to the BCA Strong Australia webinar series. Today our focus is on Wagga and surrounding regions. Thanks so much for your company and with me as well, I'm delighted to say we've got Jennifer Westacott, Chief Executive of the Business Council of Australia, Robert Spurway, Managing Director and Chief Executive of Grain Corp, Alan Johnson, Chief Executive Officer of the Committee for Wagga, McKenna Powell, Vice President of the Wagga Business Chamber, and Michael Keyes, Director of Regional Activation at the City of Wagga. Thanks everyone for being with us. Alan, uh, with your role at the Committee for Wagga, let me start with you. Looking at the numbers ahead of today's webinar, I noticed that the unemployment rate and the youth unemployment rate is stronger, is better in Wagga than it is by you know, national standards. Why is Wagga, why has Wagga been doing as well as it has? Well, Kieran, um, yes, I think one of the secrets that we have is that uh, we've got a very diverse economy. Uh, it's a very strong mixture of um, uh, public service, uh, university, TAFE. Um, also, we have the training bases for the um, three arms of the armed forces here in the city. Um, and yeah, it's a very diverse, um, multi-pillared uh, economy, uh, which has served us very well over the years and will continue to do so, I'm sure. Kieran, you're on mute. mute. Let me fix that. So Jennifer Westacott, with your recent budget submission uh, to the government, obviously a big focus on the business uh, investment incentive, but also as you've done for a long time now, you've had a, a major focus on skills. How does Wagga and its surrounds fit into that picture for you? Yeah, look, there's a few things we're saying in our budget submission to the federal government that really apply to Wagga Wagga. The first is, you know, get investment going again. Imagine, you know, if we could get every single business in Wagga Wagga investing a bit more. Uh, the second is to kind of get these activation precincts around the country and focus on places like Wagga Wagga and say, if we could combine Commonwealth and state funding, local government funding, really make um, places a magnet for big companies to go and locate their call centres there. And of course, as part of there, or locate a lot of activities there. And then as part of that, you've got to get the skills bit right. And, and, and getting these skills hub, there's a lot of fantastic uh, skills institutions there servicing the defence capability. But, you know, this could serve as many other uh, industries. So, you know, you've got these great advantages, as Alan says, of a diverse economy. What we're saying is, why don't we do these 30 year plans for uh, regions like Wagga Wagga? Why don't we work out the infrastructure priorities, the skills hubs, the digital stuff, so that we can say, how does this become a super digital economy? Because if we did that, around Australia for, I reckon, about 20 locations. We'd not just power up those regions, we'd power up the country. Just uh, unmute. So, Robert Spurway, give me a sense from your perspective as we look at not just Wagga, but this has obviously got national implications. What does a contemporary agribusiness look like? Look, as both Jennifer and Alan have said, agriculture is an important part of employment in the regions. Grainport alone uh, services our whole southern region out of Wagga Wagga. Uh, whilst we might only have 35 people employed in Wagga, uh, we permanently employ over 140 people across the region. And that will swell to an additional 700 over the next few months as we gear up for one of the best harvests in years. Uh, what that looks like across the sector is uh, digital is where agriculture is going. Many growers are already using precision, precision agricultural techniques uh, and bulk handlers like ourselves are also moving towards digital solutions that allow for contactless harvest that improves the efficiency of collecting and exporting grains uh, from the regions and, and out to global markets. Uh, but it also improves the safety of it as well. So products like our Crop Connect product, our Fastway product are digital solutions that improve transparency and efficiency and safety for our growers. McKenna, to pick up on what Robert said there about you know, agribusiness focusing on, on the digital, for, with the businesses that you deal with, how can Wagga businesses better position themselves 
for the future? Do you see it all being in that space of you know digitization and so on? We have had a lot of businesses out of the recent changes uh, move to online. They've just had to make that choice whether they were already online or not. But I think moving forward, we're really um, safe-proofing ourselves from future issues here in Wagga by uh, the rifle, so the Riverina uh, Intermodal Freight and Logistics Hub. That will enable our retailers, commercial businesses to get their products in and to export their products nationally and internationally and avoid issues that come about by pandemics or other issues like this. Michael Keyes, to you on the, the scope for, for growth, I know Alan touched on this a bit earlier, um, the plans for growth in, in the region, but how do you see attempts to capitalise on inland rail, for example? Uh, what, what's your vision for where Wagga will be in 30 years? Well, certainly, um, Kieran, the, the whole intent is to try and grow to that 100,000 target. But to do that, we've got to have jobs, we've got to have investment, and inland rail offers a significant opportunity, for, particularly for Wagga. And over the last 15 to 20 years, there's been plans in place to invest in inland rail, to invest in a, in a modal freight terminal. And I'm very, very pleased to say that we've, in recent months, we've been able to convert that to not just a dream and a plan, but a reality. Uh, we've just recently exchanged contracts uh, for the construction of a $45 million intermodal terminal, which is conveniently called Rifle, the Riverine Intermodal Freight and Logistics Centre. And that will be operated by Busy Logistics as our commercial partner. So this is a whole of government approach that's been in play for a number of years. And as Jennifer's touched on, it's about investing in infrastructure, genuine partnerships between government at all levels and the private sector that's going to create these employments and open up these opportunities. It's also about tying into that agricultural industry uh, and the food bowl that we sit at, and that's the real advantage for what we're going for. And Michael, just to continue on that, where, where else do you see scope for attracting businesses, international businesses, local, uh, but major companies. When you look at Wagga, where it's situated, uh, the supply chain, as you've touched on, and also, you know, quality of life, affordable housing, it seems like an attractive picture. It's an extremely attractive picture. It's a fantastic location that's, that's ready for, for people to come and invest and take advantage of. Uh, but it's, it's tied into all of those elements, but the other thing we're working on is with regional New South Wales, the state government who are working with international research arms to look at uh, international companies that may take advantage of the unique location, the attributes that we've got, but the Australian economy as well. But not only that, we've got some fantastic local businesses that are very unique. Uh, we have a uh, lead smelter that uh, recycles car batteries from all over Australia and, and South Pacific. Very unique skills. Uh, that are able to work with others and potentially offer those um, initiatives that, that aren't present in Western Sydney or metropolitan Melbourne. You look at the prices of, of land and the access to skilled labour, they're the, the fantastic elements that we can offer. Alan, during the pandemic, we've, we've already touched on it, we'll explore it a bit more, how businesses have adapted and so on, but what we've also seen is an easing of regulations uh, in part, red tape, uh, so, Alan, what have you seen that's, you know, in terms of that, that area, red tape, that has been eased that you would look, like to see remain permanent, that it wouldn't flip back to what it was? Um, I think probably the, the greatest example of uh, red tape being eliminated is, is, is to come with the special activation precinct in terms of the opportunity for businesses to have their development applications providing they meet the requirements for that whole industrial zone to be approved in 30 days, as opposed to whatever length, great length of time it can, you can experience um, in other parts of Australia or even for, for the time being. I think that's, that's absolutely huge in terms of eliminating um, you know, red tape, downtime, preparation time for business cases to, to make things happen. Um, yeah. Momentum is, is everything when it comes to, to, to business cases and to take the opportunities when they exist, when people are considering where they want to uh, adjust their supply chains and establish their businesses and so forth. So that, that's a great opportunity. That's a great example. Uh, and we'd love to see that extend um, yeah, 
further than the, the industrial precinct, which I'm sure in time it will. And, and uh, just a reminder to those that have joined us for this webinar, if, if you're watching, you'd like to ask one of our participants a question, please use the Q&A function on Zoom and I will put those questions as they come in to our panel. So please uh, send those questions through. But Jennifer Westcott, if you could pick up there where Alan left off in terms of where you see uh, you know, it ha obviously been a tough time, the pandemic, but there have been changes, there have been measures that have been undertaken, which most likely won't go back to what they were before. What would you like to see remain permanent? Yeah, look, this could be our moment as a country if we if we get this right, because there have been so many kind of old fashioned bits of uh, regulation that have just been put to one side. So, you know, curfews on supermarket deliveries, um, that has been essential because people have got to get things into shops to, to service the big demand. Uh, the stuff Alan's talking about, you know, planning approvals. Um, you know, people tell me all the time, it just takes too long to get stuff done. If I think about countries in other parts of the world where things get done much more quickly, you know, we're in a competition uh, for companies to come and invest here. Um, I think there's a lot more we could do on our border restrictions or making it easier to get our produce uh, out into those big international markets and use the technology, blockchain, things like that, so that we can open up uh, our agribusiness and our food manufacturing sectors. Um, you know, there's a whole lot of antiquated stuff around digital signatures, AGMs, all of these things that you, you've really got to say, well, really, do we need that back? And of course, you know, very old fashioned retail trading hours, whereas in, in some parts of the country, you can't buy a light bulb before a certain time in the day. I mean, those sorts of things are old fashioned, they've got no place in a contemporary society, you know, that we've got to kind of stay the course on making it easy to do business and not, which is always the temptation, start piling on new rules and regulations because business is going to have to go really fast uh, to recover. Uh, where they've uh, where they've had big losses and really fast, so that we can power up the economy. Robert Spurway, could you pick up on this as well? What are the the, the blockages, the red tape concerns that a, a company like yours, Grain Corp, has to manage? Look, I think Jennifer's touched on uh, many of the challenges. They're not unique to our business. They're uh, not even unique to agribusiness. Um, they they spread a, you know across the range. Uh, we're about uh, finding ways to develop employment in the regions in particular. That's going to be crucially important uh, over the next couple of years. Uh, we're very pleased, of course, with the recent weather conditions and the opportunity for a big crop. Uh, and I guess we want to make sure that not just our business, but growers and everyone in the supply chain uh, is not held back in any way uh, on being able to deliver that. Uh, one of the obvious uh, conversations is around border controls. Uh, and border closures. Uh, for the ag sector in particular, that could be a massive constraint. And uh, we need to see those freed up. We need to see them freed up quickly uh, because the economy and the opportunity in agriculture will not wait. McKenna, you touched on this a bit earlier, but if you could elaborate on it for us, uh, because we've seen it right around the country, businesses adapting in the face of this COVID-19 pandemic. It, it really has been quite extraordinary to see how nimble Australian business has been, not just large, but small and medium-sized businesses as well. Can you talk us through some of the experiences, some of the examples of that that you've seen? That's right, Kieran, because prior to COVID, our region also had the effects of the drought and still does, and the effects of the bushfires over the Christmas New Year season. So both, whilst agricultural, as Robert's um, talked to, is really thriving, our retail and commercial businesses have really had one hit after another. But as a chamber, we've been really excited to see that so many businesses have thrived where they've had to adapt their business. So whether that's moving online or expanding their online presence or changing the way that they do business. So restaurants starting to deliver meals where they can't get uh, people into the restaurants. So we see too that consumer behaviour has changed. We've got so many people now attending the farmers markets and buying produce directly and locally and trying to support one another and all local businesses reaching out and supporting one another because they are all feeling the effects of what's going on. But I think it's positive too that even after this pandemic, these businesses will keep these change processes in place. 
Yes, some of the, the benefits that will remain. Um, Alan, to you, you can re reflect on that as well if you can for us, but also tell us what sort of impact have the, the border closures down the road had? I'm obviously, Albury, Wodonga is the area where it's most affected, but has it had any flow on that Wagga and the regions had to, had to deal with? Um, probably from our perspective, um, it's had a little bit of an impact in terms of infrastructure builds where, where you've had um, uh, personnel that are coming from interstate to, to actually build um, some of our significant infrastructure projects that are currently underway. Uh, but having said that, we've still managed to be able to complete some of those in recent times. Um, obviously, the agricultural industry has those challenges which are now being addressed and um, as, as Robert said, there's uh, 700 more jobs being required in, just inside his organisation in the coming months. Um, and so we need the ability to have people move across borders to make sure that, that happens. I think um, we talked about digital there with agricultural previously. We're very bullish about the future of our area um, because of the, the forthcoming gig state um, pilot site that Wagga is going to be. Uh, very bullish about the opportunities that brings, uh, not just to the SAP, but also to the, all of the, the city, uh, the CBD areas. Uh, we've got a magnificent health and knowledge precinct, uh, brand new hospital with some of the best um, medical experts uh, in, the, in the country based here in Wagga. Um, we're extremely bullish about what additional um, services can come off the back of that enhanced digital experience that uh, the city will have very shortly. So industries that we haven't even thought about, we'll, yeah, we're looking for those to be here as, as another pillar to a strong economy. Michael Keyes, could you pick up on that as well and expand on a couple of those points, both the, the health component, the health and knowledge precinct, I guess, in the context of having not just great schools, but university campuses in, in your city. And then also in terms of the, the digital connectivity and how important that's going to be for the next, not just next year, but next decade and beyond for Wagga. Yes, yeah, certainly, Kieran. The, uh, the health and knowledge precinct is a core element of our, our whole economy. It's our, our biggest uh, industry, um, both through employment, but the services it offers as well. So we, we can service a population of up to 250,000 people across the region with our medical specialists. We have a very high number of specialists operating here in Wagga. And the, the recent investment by the state government in the new hospital, public hospital, uh, has been significant and will provide brand new world-class facilities. Coupled with that is our educational partners and research partners down there. University of New South Wales, who are about to commence training of GPs in regional areas for the first time. Uh, full course offered you know, in region, uh, as well as University of Notre Dame. But we're also working on new projects uh, with Charles Sturt University and the New South Wales TAFE to, to look at the additional health specialists. So it's not just doctors and specialists, but also all the additional services that provide support for that. It's a very big industry that provides employment uh, and investment opportunities across a, a very broad sector. Um, in addition to that, the digital connectivity is, is a major opportunity. Uh, to put it in simple terms, uh, you'll have the same level of connectivity here in Wagga as you do, even not better, than metropolitan areas. So downloading uh, from a lifestyle point of view is an important element, but more importantly for business and uh, industry to be able to access the world platform, particularly with the emphasis now with online services, being able to uh, work remotely, uh, interchange and exchange information across multiple countries uh, as well as across the nation. That is going to be imperative to what we do. We've got new data centres that are looking to set up, but operated privately, but also as Alan touched on, the New South Wales government selected Wagga uh, as one of the pilot projects for the gig state, which is about making sure that we've got uh, superior digital connectivity to the whole of the city uh, and available for industry as well as business. Jennifer, that, that sounds like a, a, a great future for Wagga, uh, but, but can you, ex, you know, explore for us the, the issue of this next phase of government spending? Because obviously with the budget coming next month, there's going to be big federal 
uh, infrastructure commitments. That combined with what Michael's saying out of the state, how do you want to see that work together? How is it going to work together most effectively in places like Wagga? Well, I think it's got to come together. That's the first thing. If everyone just tries to do a bit of this and a bit of that, nothing will happen at scale. And the sort of stuff that Michael and Alan and, and, and McKenna are talking about, if you can get it at scale, then, then big companies will also start to get very interested. So Michael's point about, you know, the University of New South Wales actually kind of doing medicine uh, from Wagga is hugely important. Now, suddenly that creates a whole lot of other industries that say, actually, we might put our little med tech centre there or we might put some med tech stuff there. You start to say to some of these very big companies who, who I talk to, who are so interested in safe location and skills, safe location and skills, hey, why don't you put your data processing, your data analytics centre in Wagga Wagga? Um, why don't you think about the fact that they've got this incredible skills capacity there? So it's about, I think, Kieran, bringing it together, Commonwealth State, bringing it together under this activation precinct model, staying the course, giving people a kind of 20, 30 year plan and not trying to dilute. And then looking at some of the things that if you really powered up inland rail or digital, where could we get to? The other thing we've got to do, I think nationally, is we've got to kind of develop this, I don't know, equivalent of a national prospectus so that we can say to all these big companies around the world who are looking at places like Hong Kong and other parts of Europe or the United States and saying, well, I'm not sure. Um, you know, let's, let's make sure we're not just talking about Sydney and Melbourne. We're talking about Wagga Wagga, we're talking about Townsville, we're talking about these places around Australia where they, we can say, you know, you know, this is a huge opportunity for your company to service the Asian marketplace from these terrific locations where there's heaps of stuff happening. Robert Spurway, let's um, zero in on your thoughts for the budget. The, the Treasurer is right in the, the thick of it now, working on this, this budget. It's going to be one like no other, but from your perspective um, at Grain Corp, what sort of policy, uh, policy commitments do you see as pivotal to try and foster some of the, the recovery, which we're going to hopefully see over 2021. I think the Business Council of Australia has done an excellent job representing all members um, around some of the policy settings. Uh, one of the challenges for government is following through on that promise and commitment uh, at all levels of the bureaucracy. It's not just the, the policy settings, it's the way it's enforced and the compliance cost on business. Um, but I do just want to emphasise uh, what Jennifer and Michael have both talked about, that infrastructure provides enduring benefits. It creates jobs from the outset, uh, and then it provides enduring benefits to the regions over time. Uh, our business has certainly been a part of that. We appreciate the funding we've had from federal and state governments uh, in New South Wales over the last two or three years, a very severe drought in the region and the benefits that's bringing now that we get back to a much better harvest. Uh, the improvements in the rail network allow efficient movement of grains and related products, uh, effectively what we call it pointing to the port at Port Kembla. Um, so those investments uh, are going to provide benefits, not just as they were built, uh, but for many years to come. And I think that's certainly something the government's very mindful of and looking at as part of uh, kickstarting regional economies in the in the next period. Alan uh, and McKenna, I'll, I'll come to uh, Alan first and get McKenna's thoughts on this as well. What would help business in Wagga uh, more than anything in terms of the, the federal budget, which is a couple of, uh, well, it's only a month away now. Um, I, I think the long-term planning aspect, um, Policies that will survive electoral cycles are really important for, um, for businesses to make long-term decisions on. Um, I agree infrastructure is, is, is extremely important, um, but it's gotta be, um, be hand-in-hand hand with uh, long-term enduring policies that uh, make uh, regional New South Wales and Wagga, uh, and regional Australia for that matter, extremely attractive um, for, for businesses to invest. Um, so I think not necessarily um, 
in the in the budget framework, but in long term policy framework, uh, that's where we see the, the most significant next step. Be it a national cabinet issue, I'd love to see decentralisation Australia wide and particularly west of the, the divide um, on the agenda for that organisation um, yeah, moving forward. McKenna, I'll get your thoughts on that too. And just a reminder for those that are joining us, please get your questions in via the Q&A function on Zoom and I will uh, ask those to our panellists shortly. But McKenna, your thoughts on uh, the budget and what would most help regional businesses in, in Wagga and surrounds? Well, Kieran, Wagga Wagga has really benefited to date by so much uh, investment in infrastructure from all levels of government. And that in turn has an accumulative effect right across our economy and makes future investment and further investment more viable. Kieran, can okay, I just... now, yep, Jennifer, you, you can pick just up. On uh, one of our signature things in our budget submission, which is a 20% investment allowance, how that works, it's an additional deduction uh, on an investment. And this is just hugely important for the sort of things that people are talking about, because what it means is a project that is sort of, you know, marginal, it makes it super attractive. And if we could get company after company starting to make those investments, whether it's a big a company like Roberts or a big mining company bringing forward its maintenance, whether it's a small business that says, you know, I can see the demand, uh, I need to kind of put on some new plant and machinery, I need to upgrade my digital systems. That gets the private sector bit by bit creating the work orders that create the employment. So our estimate is, you know, um, that this would cost $10 billion a year. Now that sounds like a lot of money, but we're spending $12 billion a month on JobKeeper. And that, that $10 billion a year that would fire up business investment would create 500,000 jobs over a decade. Now that's the sort of choices that are available to us in the budget. And we've got to get private sector investment going again, because if you do the stuff that we're talking about, governments investing in infrastructure, the private sector bringing forward its projects off the back of that, you will see Australia start to really super power up again. Yeah, and talking 500,000 jobs, $200 billion of investment over the, the next 10 years from that business, the proposed business allowance and investment allowance. Let's uh, bring in some questions now from our audience. I've got one here from Diana Somerville, and I'll, I'll put this to, to Alan and, and Michael. I'll get both of your thoughts on this, as well as McKenna. All three of you can respond if, you, if you'd like. What is the role of innovation in growing a stronger region? Also, how do we prepare and capitalise on the remote workforce? Uh, Alan, to you, and then Michael. Thanks, Kieran. Um, thanks for the question, Di. I knew this one would come. Um, I think we've, we've got a very strong uh, entrepreneur and innovation uh, cohort in the city um, in combination with the university and other groups. Um, and I know Di's group has a, has a relationship uh, with Israel. So, you know, our innovation opportunities are great. Uh, our opportunity for remote um, work is fantastic, particularly once the digital platform is up to sufficient standards. Um, Dyer's group has been very active with regard to uh, CBD revitalisation. Um, we've got a very strong ag tech area, which is very strong in the innovation area. So there's great opportunities here. Um, I'd love to see the federal government uh, as part of its policy platform really push the, the southern uh, uh, New South Wales Innovation Precinct be based here in Wagga, if I can uh, put that plug in for that. Um, but certainly, um, it's, it's really exciting. It's a different dynamic to business. And if, if we can partner innovators with established businesses, um, then it's much more strength for the, for the region as well. Michael, your thoughts on that question from Diana Somerville? Yeah, thanks, Kieran. I, I agree with uh, Alan's comments that We've got a very good base uh, in the Riverina here, and I think it's important to look at it as a, a precinct, not just about the city, but more a wider area as well. And there's opportunities, particularly in the ag sector, 
which Robert's touched on, uh, certainly the drivers there, uh, which can really maximise return, but also open up new opportunities that, uh, to challenge the ways that we've been doing things in the past, but also unlock that collaboration across different sectors uh, and different areas and different producers. I think that's the way business is going to have to look at it in the future to tackle new problems, new challenges that we get, but as a, a collaborative approach that's going to uh, tap into to new opportunities. Uh, and I think there's certainly a lot of potential here in, in the region for that to occur. McKenna, your, your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I really feel that an innovation hub is a way that we can create a point of difference for our city. If we can all collaborate together and provide that opportunity to support startups, but also existing businesses to innovate in the way they do things, then that really sets us apart as a regional capital to do business in. Jennifer, have you seen any other models locally, internationally, that uh, that, you, that come to mind when we discuss a thing like this and, and the challenge for Wagga to capitalise on the, a remote workforce like that? Sure. Look, around the world, um, you know, I led uh, the uh, women's delegation to Israel last year. Uh, and you see that focus that they have on particular regions and they really invest and they go very hard at particular industries. If I think about uh, the United Kingdom where they have these catapults around the country and they pick a particular technology like 3D printing or something and they get government, academic and businesses working together at a local level. And then I'm very fortunate to chair what's called the Aerotropolis Authority or the Western Parkland Authority in Western Sydney which will be the advanced manufacturing hub and the agribusiness precinct that will surround the Nancy Bird Walton Airport. And what's so interesting in getting these big companies to come and invest there, Hitachi, GE, is what they want is the sorts of things we're talking about today. They want to see those big infrastructure plans. They want to see access to things like a 24-7 airport. They want to see government coordination. They want to see federal and state working together. And we're starting to see, you know, big results uh, at the Aerotropolis. The CSRO will now locate its Sydney headquarters there. That's going to create job after job after job after job after job. So, you know, I've seen it around the world. I've seen it in Australia. You can see from what um, Michael, McKenna and Alan are talking about, you've got all of the essential ingredients there in Wagga Wagga to basically get, get fire up, fire powered up. There's one component, Matthew Steed, uh, one of our the members of the audience has asked, Jennifer, I'll go to you first on this to help. And he says, because I know it's something that we've discussed in other regions throughout the uh, Strong Australia book series. And this one is to help manage businesses from Wagga, how can we get more affordable flights in and out of Wagga Regional Airport and connect to more airport hubs around the nation, Jennifer? Look, it's a great question. Um, the first thing is we have to get the country going again. Uh, this is why, you know, the first thing in our budget submission is, is a three-month plan to open up domestic borders because until we get the airline industry up and running again, it's impossible to talk about more flights uh, to anywhere in particular. But, but secondly, we've got to see uh, that flight density, that, de that sort of massive flights linked to uh, industry expansion in the way that we've been talking about today. And this is my point about federal government, state government and business concentrating on, you know, fewer areas, but making them really, really um, flex up. So look, it's not an easy answer at the moment. Aviation is obviously probably one of the hardest hit sectors by the pandemic, but we've got to find a way in the first instance to carefully, gradually, um, but, you know, the plan that National Cabinet started to work through uh, on Friday, the three month um, or, you know, open by business uh, by Christmas, that's a light at the end of the tunnel. We've got to keep going with that. Yeah, and if I can just jump in there, I think one of the great advantages of Wagga is that we do have the airport here where you can fly in and out of Melbourne or Sydney within an hour and daily you can be in and out in a day. So if you're setting up a business here, you have that accessibility to the cities but also you have that lifestyle for your family as well. And you have the education facilities to support your families. You have uh, all the employment opportunities with the medical precinct, um, the defence force here, all the retail and professional services. So if anyone's locating or setting up a business in Wagga or decentralising, we have all the benefits of lifestyle living in a regional area, but access to the city at our fingertips. 
The only other thing I'd say, Kieran, in, in to just build off McKenna's point and what I see around the world and um, in Australia, you know, airports are really important things. Don't build them out. Don't put, you know, curfews on them that don't work. Don't make them hard to get into because if we want to get into these international markets, you know, mistakes have been made uh, all around the world, but in Australia where people have built out airports, they've made it difficult to run them 24 seven. That's what's attractive. Um, not just for passengers, but for freight, people forget more than 70 or 80% of freight goes out in a passenger plane, not in a, uh, uh, you know, not in a cargo plane. So very important that we, we protect, if you will, the full utility of an airport. Um, Robert Spurway, I'm interested in your thoughts on this question. This is from Samantha Beresford. Uh, and Samantha asks, what role do you think universities play in helping the region grow and prosper? How important are they to regional areas such as Wagga? I think universities and the research sector generally is critical. Um, Organisations like CSIRO and others also have a very important role to uh, match business with research to deliver innovation that's valuable to the economy. Uh, and business has got a big role to make sure that they're, they're pulling on that research. I think just building on the innovation theme, the role that regions play in that is take our business, which uh, partners with growers, we're about agribusiness. A lot of that's about people. So we've moved a number of our regional operational roles uh, and grower services teams out of Sydney to Wagga Wagga and to Tamworth. Uh, having those people living and working in those communities uh, creates greater opportunity to understand the innovation needs make those connections, whether it be with universities, whether it be with growers. Uh, so I think the regions have got a very important role to play in that. And we're certainly seeing the benefits of having more of our leadership based out in the regions uh, in centres like Wagga Wagga. Well, I'm sure they're happy to as well. The, the lifestyle for one is, is uh, wonderful as McKenna touched on earlier. Michael Keyes, your thoughts on Samantha's, Samantha Beresford's question there in relation to universities and their role in the region. Obviously, Wagga's got, got a few campuses and how do you reflect on that? We've got, a, we're very fortunate to have the presence that we do, but I, I think the critical part of having universities is having that uh, level of research and creative thinking. So to have that sort of culture in your city is, is extremely important to foster and, and create new ideas, challenge existing and create that uh, creative society. Uh, is a key element for, for being competitive uh, and for marketing ourselves outside just the region and going broader. Um, the universities are a critical part of, of our future and we're working very closely with them to try and promote that uh, and we'll continue to do so. McKenna, I'm going to ask you this question. This is from Edward Wellam. He says, how do we market ourselves to make it easier for businesses to see the strategic advantages of Wagga? How do you respond to that? I think having a really strong chamber helps with that and also with the Business Council of Australia being able to advocate for Wagga as well. As I said before, we really have the lifestyle option but the access to the city. We have all the investment in infrastructure and support here. It really is a thriving economy and we really want to be known as that, you know, regional capital of Australia. Jennifer Westacott, your thoughts on that? I think, um, look, and I'm sure you're doing that, but I think this idea of making sure that if, if, if you've got like a, what I call a prospectus, you know, so that, that, you know, if I'm talking to a big company, I can say, well, hang on, here's what is available in Wagga. Um, here's what you could do. Here are some of the concessions that are available. You've also got to make it like a competitive advantage as well. So. Now, I'm not a big fan of economic zones and tax breaks and things like that, because I think it distorts the tax system. However, you can do things like, uh, well, you know, fast track planning approval. That, that means a lot. Give people a bespoke skills package. So you, as the industry partner, can actually decide the sorts of skills you want and how you buy them uh, off a university or a TAFE. So it's that sort of stuff, I think, that when I talk to those big global companies, they get very excited by that, much more excited by that than 
I mean, they would love the tax system to be more competitive in Australia, but they get very excited by, you know, I could get this skills package, I could get a planning approval more quickly. And most important, and this is what the Singaporeans, they do it fantastically, single points of contact, somebody who walks an investor through the system, because it is complicated. Uh, that sort of stuff, I think, is the sort of stuff that we can work with the, the chamber on to really make sure that, you know, when I'm talking to those super big companies, I say, hey, hey think about this place. Alan, uh, you know, from the committee for Wagga perspective, how would you respond to that from Edward? How do we make, how do we market ourselves to make it easier to see the strategic advantages? Um, I think we've touched on some of those. Um, uh, ideas like a prospectus, and I know Council have, have gone a long way down that path already. Uh, we have a similar one. Um, I think we're in competition uh, with the rest of the world, with the rest of Australia and with other cities in New South Wales for that matter. So we've got to market ourselves uh, and demonstrate our point of difference. We've got to maximise the spend in the local area as well, um, be it from infrastructure builds or onshoring manufacturing or call centres and so forth to keep the dollars in here to so that the city um, yeah, continues to grow off its own back as well. I think, as I said, we're in a competition. We've really got to be constantly marketing the city. We've got to make it affordable. I saw one of the questions there about uh, how, how we can make flights um, yeah, more cost efficient and so forth. And I think it's, it's volume. Um, got to get the economy back up and going. In the previous life, I worked for an international organisation who ran its Australian-New Zealand operation from Wagga for 20 years. Um, so it's absolutely doable. Um, there's companies doing that right here, right now. Um, so we just need to keep you know, marketing those uh, opportunities and you know, just demonstrating that it can be done and is being done. Robert away from the from your perspective, uh, as you look at various regions, but Wagga is our focus today, what, what would be your advice to the region in terms of how it uh, projects and, and markets itself? I think there's two things. The first is very real examples. Ask any one of the people that work for us in, in Wagga or around that region, particularly those that have shifted there in the last two years from Sydney, uh, and they positively glow about the opportunities, the lifestyle, uh, but most importantly, it's underpinned by the fact that they have good employment there. The second thing is a point Jennifer made. We really need to focus on getting Australia moving again. Tourism, hospitality, industries like that are critically important to regional economies, but also to the lifestyle of people that live there. Uh, people want to live in regions where they have the benefits of, uh, of entertainment and, and opportunities. Uh, and for businesses to thrive uh, in the regions, they need tourism, they need people moving around to make those businesses viable. So uh, it's important we don't look at any sector in isolation. Uh, the people that we have that are proud advocates of the regions working in agriculture uh, also rely on the strength of those other related industries. You're on mute, Karen. Uh, my apologies, there we go. Uh, I'll stay with you, Robert, for this one. If there wasn't an investment allowance, as argued for by the BCA, what projects could you implement and how many sort of jobs are we talking about? Uh, look, I, I think it's difficult to be drawn on specifics in that sort of case. Uh, to Jennifer's point, the investment allowance helps, but uh, certainly uh, speedier um, planning approvals, uh, ease of doing business is just as important. Uh, typically, businesses won't allocate capital solely um, on incentives and, and tax breaks and investment allowances. Uh, they'll do it in conjunction with freeing up planning approvals, uh, speed of making things happen. Um, in our case, to answer your question, I've already talked about the, the importance of infrastructure and transport infrastructure in particular. Uh, we talked about the relevance of rail in our network, uh, but also roading is important as well to make sure that uh, the transport industry generally can be efficient where it comes to moving produce and, for that matter, people around. Jennifer, can you elaborate on that as well for this question uh, in terms of 
what sort of projects would you envisage through that 20% investment allowance proposed by the, the BCA? I know you did touch on the number of jobs. We're talking about 500,000 jobs across the decade. Michael, Alan and McKenna might have a view as well, but I'm sure every, um, every business has got a project it wants to do and they've got demand for it. Uh, and so you, you suddenly get a 20% bonus deduction and, and that, the maths start looking pretty good. And so you bring that forward. So whether that's plant and, and equipment, if you're talking about uh, the agribusiness um, system or this important discussion we've been having about digital. So one of the features about our investment allowance is it's very broad. So it's not just for uh, you know, heavy machinery, it's also for things like digitizing your business. Now, you know, that's gonna be crucial for any business, whether it's uh, pandemic or post pandemic, you're gonna to have to be digital. Your customers are gonna be digital. People have made that change, they're not gonna go back. So bringing forward your automation, bringing forward the training of your people around that automation. Uh, you know, those things, as I said, they all create a work order somewhere in the system. They create demand. But Michael and, and Alan and McKenna will have a view about the sorts of things that you know, companies might uh, spend in, in Wagga uh, that would get a 20% bonus deduction. Someone says, gee, that's starting to stack up now. Well, let's go to McKenna and then we'll go to Michael and Alan as well. But McKenna, your thoughts on that? I think any investment we can provide to infrastructure or helping reduce overheads that's where we really need to be concentrating, um, addressing skill shortages in industries. So as a chamber, we were proactive and reached out to Minister Lee um, to work on how we can address the skill shortages in Wagga. So he's currently um, doing a pilot in another regional town and we're closely following that. And Minister Lee will be coming to Wagga for a number of days when COVID restrictions lift to meet with a number of industry groups here in town and with our TAPE and council and other uh, organisations to see what we can do here to address these shortages and um, help these industries thrive. Alan, your thoughts on that investment allowance? Um, being, a, being an accountant in a previous life, that's always an attractive thing to, uh, to consider, but uh, uh, probably not the thing that uh, you would base your business case on, but it's, it's probably the icing on top. Um, but uh, I think there's this opportunity for perhaps a, a different style of, an, I'll call it an investment allowance for want of a better term, and that would be um, enticing um, jobs that have been offshore to become back onshore, maybe some sort of an allowance for those particular uh, jobs for international and national companies who have seen fit to, to take uh, job opportunities offshore for obviously a cost benefit. Let's bring those back, uh, provide uh, an allowance of some description for a number of years uh, to relocate those particular jobs out into places such as Wagga off the back of the, the digital um, platform that's coming and, and maybe some enhanced uh, allowances for those that are investing in the digital platform to, to really drive our opportunities. Michael? Yeah, thanks, Karen. Um, I think there's a, a real positive around that uh, incentive that, that could make or assist businesses make that final decision to commit to options that they've had on the on the books they've been thinking about. COVID has obviously made them check and double check and, and be a bit more conservative in some regards. But to get that stimulus to get it back up and going again, this is the sort of incentive that could help make that decision. Uh, and particularly, we've got a number of companies that are local that are looking to potentially relocate or expand their business. And this could provide that, uh, that opening for them to do that. Gen generate further investment, further employment. Uh, and that's what we need to get things going again. Alan and uh, McKenna, I'll, get, I'll go back to you on this question. This is from Kenji Sato from the Daily Advertiser, the local paper. How can we ensure a future for local media, especially at a time when newspapers and radio news bulletins are being gutted across regional Australia. Um, I'll go to you, Alan, first. Uh, yeah, not a simple answer for one, one city to, to make a, a difference on, but uh, um, we have a, a local newspaper, the Daily Advertiser, um, which, yeah, regional cities need an advertising, uh, advertising and a newsworthy um, platform um, to, to communicate with 
with all our citizens and, and with the rest of the world. Yeah, we've seen it locally in terms of yeah the, the reducing numbers and the, and the content and so forth. Um, it, there is no easy answer. Um, the, the social platforms and the digital platforms are the, you know, probably the path forward, but uh, we do need to have some balanced content um, uh, out there in the in the in the public domain. Um, federal government is probably where that's got to come from. Um, but uh, no easy answer, I don't think. No, McKenna, your reflections on that, any thoughts? I think, Karen, if we want to keep local media, we have to support local media. So local business has to choose local media to advertise in. We have to uh, purchase our media locally. And I think a great initiative out of COVID is we had a local business realising that other businesses couldn't afford advertising during this period. So each week they would support another business and provide advertising in the local paper for them. So I think that's a great way that locals have supported local, local businesses, but also the local media as well. Jennifer and, and Robert, I want to ask you a, a broader question now, not specific to, to Wagga, but obviously it's got implications for, for agribusiness there and right around the, the country. And that is our relationship with China it's at a new low, uh, two correspondents, the last two Australian correspondents in Beijing, Jennifer, returned back this morning. How worried are you about where it's at? Well, it's a very serious development today and, and no one should take it lightly at all. I think a couple of important things here. Um, you know, we have very mutually dependent economies and that's a good thing. Uh, you know, we've got a lot of things people want to buy from us. Um, uh, we, you know, trade has been strong between the two countries, and it's a it's a careful balancing act. I mean, we can't subordinate our national security and our sovereignty, but at the same time, we need uh, China and we need other parts of Asia to drive a stronger recovery. So, you know, you know, governments have done this very well. They've they've been very careful. You know, we've got to kind of get that uh, balancing act right, and we've got to remember. Uh, that we're not the only country in the world that's got a difficult and intense relationship with China. You know, there are many countries uh, comparable to us, Canada being the most obvious one, where there are some, there, there are big tensions. And we've got to stay the course in, in making sure that we, we maintain that long-term relationship, keep that trade going, but don't surrender our sovereignty and security. Robert, your thoughts on, on where we're at? Because obviously, you know, we've seen the issues with wine, beef and, and barley, that uh, recent quarantine seizure at, at a port in China. Uh, what, what do you make of where things are at at the moment? A, a pretty low ebb. Um, look, I think it's more important to look at the fundamentals. People always need to eat. Uh, there's probably not a better time to be a farmer, to be in food, to be in agribusiness. Uh, global trade of agricultural products in particular um, has always been something that's closely looked at by governments all around the world. Uh, so I think it's important that we broaden it just from uh, one particular uh, marketing um, opportunity and look more generally. Uh, the way we look at it is uh, the world needs Australian uh, food, uh, China included in that, Asia as well. Uh, the economies are close and geographically close, so there's huge opportunities there. Um, we certainly um, think it's important as well that once the borders are open to make sure that we can uh, rebuild those company-to-company -company relationships. Uh, ultimately, that's what's important about any trading relationship, uh, irrespective of geopolitical uh, challenges that exist in the world generally. So, uh, look, we're, we're very confident about the ongoing demand for food around the world. Uh, the role that China will play in that. Uh, and as uh, Jennifer said, um, you know, that, that builds optimism and, and confidence, uh, but also a degree of caution as we move forward to, to really develop those relationships at a more personal level. Yeah, that's interesting. The company to company links to another aspect of those uh, people to people links that are, are pretty important in a bilateral relationship. I want to finish now with a question to all of you. This is from Justine Kirk, and I'll go to Michael, Michael Keyes first of all. But Justine asks, how do we ensure that the funding coming into the region is spent on local employment rather than going to organisations located in the big cities? I'll go to each, each of you, but we'll start with Michael. 
Yeah, I, I think it's a great question uh, and very valid. And, and one of the interesting aspects that we've seen recently is this change in rather than providing financial incentives to businesses to relocate or establish, we're actually moving towards, and this is particularly through the special activation precinct here, investing in infrastructure. Putting the investment in infrastructure creates the, the opportunity to invest locally, and that stays locally through the employment and investment that comes out of that rather than some companies that might play off different states or different regions uh, and potentially use that as a lever and then take advantage of a, a financial incentive short term. Uh, this is about a long-term play and a long-term investment and a partnership between, again, local government, state government, federal, but also private uh, enterprise as well. Uh, and it's really about trying to generate that income uh, and returns and employment for the local area. McKenna, McKenna Powell. I think it's a great opportunity as we all collaborate together rather than working individually, which you know, we do as groups together every fortnight. We can package our services together, ensure the funding's being channeled together in the right places. And as a chamber, and I believe the council does, does as well, we have these policies to always acquire locally first where we can. Alan? Yeah, I think the, and this applies to all levels of government, that drive various infrastructure projects in particular, the procurement policies and, and practices of all levels of government really do need to have um, significant uh, opportunities to, to source from local construction companies, service industries and so forth to maximise the, the multiplier effect of dollars spent in the, in the various centres, regions. Um, not always possible, uh, depending on what the unique skill sets that are required, but certainly uh, those procurement practices and policies at, at all levels can make a huge difference to, to the regions and the cities such as Bogger. Robert Spurway. Well, look, agribusiness is centred on regional Australia. That's where the, the job creation is and where the opportunity is. We've talked about the importance of enduring infrastructure to improve the efficiency um, of the industry. And I spoke about with the upcoming harvest, uh, the more than 700 uh, seasonal casuals we ex expect to employ in the southern region. That's uh, part of uh, more than 3,000 we expect to employ across East Coast Australia. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, just in summary, uh, the, the sectors that are important to the regions are what's going to create the jobs uh, over time. And, and Jennifer Westacott, uh, your, your response to that, but also to, to wrap up for us as we conclude this Strong Australia webinar event and um, focusing on Wagga, Jennifer. Yeah, look, this is where long-term economic development planning really matters because you can say, what are the industries we want to attract? What are the industries that need to go with those? How do we attract them? How do we build up, uh, to use that jargon, the ecosystem so that people can source locally, they can uh, source uh, local industries, buy from local industries. So I think that's why it's important that we're having these events, we're talking to local organisations about how do you get those long-term plans uh, for both infrastructure, economic development. Two other really quick things. If the skills aren't there, people will not do it. They will not bring their stuff to Wagga Wagga if they cannot get the skilled people to do it. So this is why building the skills, getting it easier for people to get skills rather than having to do three or four year degrees, micro-credentials, short courses, industry driven. And then the final point I'd make here in is don't make it hard to do business. Don't make it expensive to do business. Don't make it uncertain to do business because all of that adds to cost and it makes local things not as competitive as other things. So, you know, this should be a real focus on how do we lower the cost of doing business because that's what will attract other companies, other investments. That's what will get employment going. Thanks so much to our audience for, for joining us for this Strong Australia webinar event on Wagga. Thank you to, to Jennifer Westacott from the BCA, Robert Spurway from Grain Corp, Alan Johnston from the Committee for Wagga, McKenna Powell from the Wagga Business Chamber and Michael Keyes, Director of Regional Activation of the City of Wagga. Thank you to you all and uh, appreciate your time. All the best. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Cheers.